Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome to Postcards from a Dying World, episode number 49. I have a special guest today. Uh, and, it, and before I get into that, though, and introduce him, who he needs very little introduction, but I'm going to anyways. Um, but next episode, episode 50, is a special episode. I am turning, I'm having the tables turned on me and Desmond Reddick of Dread Media is interviewing me for the 50th episode about my books, my career. And um, look, I do enough for the bookosphere at this point. I can let Desmond talk to me for a little bit. And so um, that one's gonna be pretty fun. Uh, I've already recorded it, spoiler alert, and, and Desmond and I had a lot of fun. Uh, Desmond knows my work probably better than maybe like two or three other people who I actually consider like editors or trusted readers like Des is, is, is right up there. So it's a, a fun time. Anyways, this episode, we're welcoming uh, the legend, the grandmaster of horror. I got to see him get that award in Portland, uh, Brian Keene. Oh, there it is, if you're there watching is. on YouTube. And uh, Brian Keene is the author of probably his most famous book is The Rising, um, where he revolutionized the, zom the zombie. Uh, one of my favorites, The Conqueror Worms, uh, Earth Worm, or Earth, oh God, I always say the other title wrong. Earthworm Gods. Earthworm Gods, which is as actually one of my favorite of yours. It just, it really tickled me. I like weird apocalypses. So it just really worked well for me. Um, and Ghoul and uh, the new vampire novel with teeth, your first novella about vampires, I believe, yeah. right? Yep. And um, also longtime host of the horror show with Brian Keene. This is going to be a little different. We're not breaking down a book. I know that's usually what I do. Um, and I do like to break down books, but um, I have very specific reasons where I want to talk to Brian today. It'll become clear as you listen, but um, I'm also doing more interviews recently, Brian, where I'm just having people on that I think are interesting. <laughs> well, that's cool, man. And, and congrats on the 50th episode. Uh, Desmond is a great interviewer. So, yeah, you know, that, that's going to be fun to tune in and hear. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. Um, yeah, and he's, I, was he's actually, I was actually the first interview on Dread Media ever. Um, really? Yes, in 2000, yeah. 2009, I did. A, I was living up in that neck of the woods near him in Canada, and I did a, a a book signing for my first short story collection in Victoria, Canada, and one person showed up. It was Desmond. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and he uh, did an, an interview for his brand new podcast, Dread Media, at the time. Yeah. No, he's he's there. a great interviewer. So congrats on that. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. So, but anyways, um, so Brian, uh, for for anyone who might be new to your work, and because um, I know I got a lot of sci-fi people who listen to this podcast too, or people who try to check out these to get new names and authors, tell everybody a little bit about who you are and where you come from. I know a lot of the listeners already know this stuff, but some don't. So give people a little introduction into to, to Brian Keene. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've written, oh gosh, over 50 books at this point. Uh, you know, I'm primarily known as a horror writer. Most of the awards they give me are for my horror fiction, but I do also write, you know, sword and sorcery, uh, weird fantasy, uh, crime fiction. I've done a lot of nonfiction, you know, just uh, one of my icons is Hunter S. Thompson, you know, and I, I've always liked that that form of, of socio-political essay writing. Uh, so I, I do a little bit of everything. I also uh, have written for both Marvel and DC as well as, you know, media properties like Doctor Who and Aliens and the X-Files. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing this, I guess, what, 20 years now? Yeah, you, um, yeah, for you know, quite a while. <laughs> yeah, nobody's told me to leave yet. So, you know, I'm just, I'm going to stick with it until that happens. 
Well, and look, so a lot of people know you from or discovered you through, you did for many years, you did the horror show with Brian Keene podcast. Right. And um, one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to have this conversation is, is part of, you know, a lot of, when, you know, as somebody who listened every single week to, to the horror show um, with you and your awesome co host, um, I felt like it was interesting because I had already met you and hung out with you at conventions. And so I could understand that there was a slight difference in the persona you were creating for, for the show, right. to the entertainment. And for Brian Keene, the, just the chill dude that I hung out with at conventions. And so like what I kind of wanted to do was just, I wanted a chance to give people kind of a window, like a little more, I'm not going to say toned down, but a little bit more natural of Brian Keene. And I know you've done lots of other things on YouTube and stuff recently. So that's out there. But just for, for my sake, um, I, I wanted to give people a window into, into, because I think you're an extremely thoughtful person who thinks very deeply about the craft and the genre as a community. So let's start first with how you discovered horror fiction and, you know, like what it meant to you as a kid, because I know you're one of those, like, like Jeremy Robert Johnson and I, who were locked in from a very oh, young yes. age. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I'm, I'll be 54 this year. Um, so for me, it, it started back in the early 70s. And for like a lot of people my age, it, it wasn't prose fiction. It, it started with comic books. Uh, I can very distinctly remember 1976. I go to the newsstand with my dad and, I, and he buys me my first two comic books. And it was uh, Captain America and the Falcon by Jack Kirby, which was cool and very colorful and you know bonkers. Uh, but the other one he gets me is this comic called The Defenders by Steve Gerber and, and Sal Buscema. And there's witchcraft and weird aliens and, and all this weird science stuff going on. It, it was a horror comic. You know, it, it was a superhero comic ostensibly, but it, it was horror. And I'll never forget, I read it cover to cover. And then I read it again before dinner. And after dinner, I went back to reread it. And I noticed it said written by. And it, it clicked in my head. This is a job that a grown up can have. Um, so, you know, for a couple of years, it was it was comics. And for whatever reason, I gravitated toward the horror comics. Now, you know, I I did not have an easy upbringing. Uh, my parents tried to do the best they could, but it was it was the immediate aftermath of Vietnam and America was tearing itself apart. And, uh, you know, my, my dad was a, a non veteran. Uh, I know he was pretty messed up from it. Most of my friends' fathers were pretty messed up from it. Um, you know, I, I've written extensively about that, fictionalized, but drawing from that for a, a novel called Ghoul and a, a movie called Ghoul, um, you know, it, it wasn't an easy upbringing. So maybe subconsciously that's what attracted me to the monsters and the scares. I don't know. Uh, all I know is uh, I always thought the monsters were the coolest thing um you know eventually i did graduate to pro it was uh i think first was stephen king and then immediately after him f paul wilson and you know it just it took off from there uh i'm a voracious reader i read sci-fi i read fantasy i read you know non-fiction historical accounts whatever i can get my hands on but uh the horror genre is always going to be my favorite Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's that idea that you have to be a reader really before you can be a writer because you have to kind of have the brain that that consumes words. And yeah. if, if you don't, you're not you're good like that kind of that kind of poserness, if you're not actually a reader, shines through so quickly when when you're reading like a manuscript or something by somebody. Um, did you have a story that was kind of like a light bulb moment or like any, can you, can you point to any like novel or story that really like, for me, it was the raft by Stephen King. Like, That's the, yeah, that was a great one. I remember reading that in high school, uh, a, a girl I knew, I, I knew her since first grade and I know her still, she runs uh, the library in my hometown, Erica Hamilton, shout out to you, Erica. She had a, a chapbook of the raft and i remember 
we were at some assembly, I think we were in 10th grade and, you know, the whole student body's there and, and we're not paying attention to what's going on the stage. We're taking turns reading this, this draft chat book. Um, I think probably for me with King, it was what taught me the, the power and the possibility of writing it was pretty early on and it was Salem's Lot. Uh, you, you know, it's this novel about this small American town and it's, it's slowly dying. And, you know, in the novel, of course, what's killing it is a vampire, but living in this small rural Pennsylvania town, which was also slowly dying. And, and what was, what was killing us was, uh, you know, unchecked capitalism was, was killing our paper mill and everybody relied on that paper mill for, for a living, whether they worked there or not. Um, and, you know, I, I can't sit here and say as a kid that I saw all those parallels, but I felt them. The novel felt very real to me. The, the kid in the novel, Danny, you know, it's the first time I remember really identifying with someone. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it was the first time that I read something and it wasn't just a story to me. I was like, you know, wow, this is, this is really about something deeper. Um, so that was my first inkling that, you know, there's, there's power in what we're doing. And absolutely growing up where you did in Pennsylvania, I'm sure connected you to that novel oh, yeah. in, in a way that, um, you know, very little else would. And um, I think like the actual writing in, uh, of King was already like so ahead of the game because he had so many novels that he had written that he hadn't published. I think, um, I think that novel would 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 um, would be one that would teach you so much just from construction and and, and I, you know there were there were others when I got older. Uh, you know, as a young man, I remember uh, right after I got out of the Navy, uh, Joe R. Lansdale's The Drive-In. You know, because it was. Up until that point, I was very genre focused. It had to be a horror story or a science fiction story or a Western. And the drive-in is really a genre unto its own. It's, it's, a, it's a prototype for what today is called Bizarro. Um, Absolutely. You know, so that was an eye opener. Uh, Jack Ketchum, my, my dear friend, Jack Ketchum, Dallas Mayer was his real name. Um, I wouldn't have a career without the guy. And, uh, you know, his novel, The Girl Next Door, it, it is not an easy read. You know, it, it's the literary equivalent of getting shot in the face with a shotgun. Right. Well, if you study it as a writer and, and look at what he does with an economy of words. Absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah. he, 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 it's a hardcore horror novel, but your brain is filling in those details. He's not telling them to you. And, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot from that. Uh, and, and I still learn today at 53, you know, younger authors will, will send me their manuscripts and, and I'll read them. And, and I'm still picking up stuff from them. You know, I don't think you ever stop learning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and I think you've hit on a key thing here that, that um, it's funny all the time because I've told people that I think some people miss the boat on, on, on what your personal impact is on the community in a sense, because a lot of times people just point to the kind of battles that you had through the podcast with um, partic particular fuckery, like for example, dark regions or whatever. Right. Like, so yes, you, or leisure books, like when you had that huge battle with them, yes, that's important. But what I think is really important that Brian Keene, the, member of the community does and you just did it really effortlessly in the in the last answer which is connecting the genre to the human beings who created it and who are part of it and it's that written by thing so for me it was i discovered that writers were a thing because of um i was a huge twilight zone and star trek kid as a kid and the first time I saw Richard Matheson's name on the spine of a book and I said wait I've seen that guy's name on Star Trek I've seen that guy's right. name on, on the Twilight Zone and I think what you did that's underrated on on the horror show is connect people to the humanity of the genre 
and like who we are as people and you know a book like the girl next door couldn't happen without the humanity of dallas right absolutely and so a lot of times what we see in the genre community is 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 you know there are writers who who may have commercial success but don't like stick around because they don't have that kind of human connection or you might have somebody self-publish a novel and you know they might be wondering like why am i not connecting with the audience why am i not connecting with the thing well a lot of times they have like excellent plot points and maybe they have a great idea right but so much of what you know the most important words in scare are c a r e right and if you don't absolutely right and i know it's corny but if you don't connect to the humanity of it you know what what the fuck are we doing well that's that's absolutely it that's why you know let's 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 take cinema for example friday the 13th sure they're fun to watch it's fun to watch jason slaughter a bunch of surplus teenagers but they are not effective horror movies you know if if a reader or a viewer of horror if, if their desired intent is to be scared or made uncomfortable friday the 13th ain't going to do that for you because you don't you don't give a shit about any of the characters you don't care about them um you know horror is most effective when when you get down to the humanity and, and give your reader or your re viewer a reason to empathize with these people and the, the terrible things that are happening to them. Exactly. But what I, and, and, but what I, I really do want to drill down on this is because I do think that the humanity of the people who make it is so important as well. Absolutely. Because, and, 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 and what I think was underrated about what you did with the horror show was to in the interviews connect people to like who is this human being in this person who for example because i don't live on the east coast i've never had the chance to meet stephen kazanowski right right but i love the hermatophages right i thought it was a great book and i discovered it through your podcast and like i feel like I understand Stephen Kozanowski and like if we lived in the same town, I know we'd be buds. You guys would be like that. Knowing you both, yeah, you, you, yeah. you'd hit it off. It, but like what I really appreciated is that like through the podcast, I got a chance to kind of, I wanted to read the Humanophages not just because the concept is very, very me, sci-fi horror, right? Right. Like I love the concept, but the reason why I took the next step of actually ordering the book and getting it was because after a couple of appearances, like I felt like, you know, after he had a couple of appearances on the podcast, I'm like, I understand that dude. Like he's he's somebody I can relate to you as, as a part of the community. And so now, and so I tell people too, is like, don't be afraid to show people who you are because sometimes that can be the reason why somebody wants to pick up a book, you know? Absolutely, it can, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it was, I remember like when when I first started seriously making an attempt to write and get published and stuff, you know, the, the convention scene was very different back then. We didn't have, you know, the fan centric conventions that we have now. It, it, it was more professional gatherings for writers, things like that. And, you know, I would go and I was a, I, I wasn't a wallflower. I've never been that guy. But, you know, I, I was I was nervous. You know, meeting Dallas for the first time, meeting Lansdale, meeting Richard Lehman, you know, all these guys. Um, and they were just they were just fucking human beings, man. They, they, you know, they had the, the same fears and the same worries and everything that I had. And they were uniformly all welcoming, um, you know. And and every one of my peers that's my age that went through it at that time, you know, folks like Tim Levin, Mary San Giovanni, Weston Oaks, Rath James White, they all echo that. They all had the same experience. And uh, that is, it, it can't be stated enough how important that is, I think, to, to fostering talent and growth in our field, in our community. And, and I know all of us, it's something we've tried to pay for, um, you know, to the generation coming up behind us. I, I just, I think it's, it's really 
important. And yeah. you see it, you see it before us too. We we were lucky enough uh, several years ago. We uh, we got to go to Brown University and view H.P. Lovecraft's papers. And you know, in those papers was a letter that fourteen-year-old Robert Block had written to Lovecraft, and then Lovecraft had written him back. And we got to read the whole exchange. Um, you know, then our friend Dallas Jack Ketchum writing to Robert Block as a young man and Block encouraging him, then Dallas encouraging me, me encouraging Kazanowski. You know, it, there's a, I'm not a new agey guy, but there's, there's something there. There's some kind of deeper connection, I think. Yeah, we had a chance to, uh, through Dickheads, we interviewed uh, Betsy Wolheim, who runs Daw Books, because um, her father, you know, through, you know, was Philip K. Dick's main editor for many, many years, published right a lot of his books. And then, you know, before the process of doing the podcast, right, I had no idea who Don Wolheim or Tony Boucher was, right. right? And then I discovered that Tony Boucher was the guy who not only first published Philip K. Dick, but first published Richard Matheson um, and started to learn about these editors that worked behind the scenes back in the day. And it's like one of the, while we were interviewing Betsy, she just like pulls out a letter a handwritten letter that she has that Lovecraft had sent her father, like in the thirties, right? Like while we're talking like, oh, look at this, right. you know? Oh, and by the way, that's the print on the wall. The first time the word science fiction was used on the cover of a book that Don Wolheim published. Yeah. You know, just amazing shit. And then you look at like, it's the tradition, like here's Don Wolheim, this like secular, like Jewish kid from New York writing a letter to, Lovecraft, right? But the the fandom and the connection and the things that they had, you know, and then Don Wolheim goes out to a convention in Denver, the first science fiction convention in Denver, and then teaches the West Coast, oh, here's this H.P. Lovecraft guy, you got to read him, yep. right? And we take for granted how like fast everything travels because of the internet these days, but it is so important for the young people to learn about the history of the genre and the things absolutely that, it is yeah and one of the reasons why we do dickheads is because and take that history seriously is that i understand phil k dick so much more now because i've learned the complicated history <laughs> of, of that man <laughs> you know but i've learned so much and i think um Another thing that I valued about what you did at, at the horror show is that you took the history seriously, right? And 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 I do think that that um because you know just the name the horror show, you guys were paying it forward and and, and and paying tribute to the history of the genre just with a name. Yep. And I know a lot of it was originally your plan to do with your late friend, um, Jesus Gonzalez and, right. and, and paying a lot of tribute to him as well. And, but what I want to get into for people is to understand that you are a part, you Brian Keene and you, whoever's listening to this, who wants to be a part of the genre are a part of that history. And it's incumbent on you to take the time to learn it. You know, because I'm sure you would say that learning that history in the early days was fundamental that translated into your fiction. What's a way that you think learning that history translated into the success on the page? I mean, I can, I can give you a, a very clear example. Um, F. Paul Wilson, like I said, he was the second guy I started reading after King. And, you know, Paul is... No, he's one of my favorites as well. Yeah, you know, Paul's kind of a big deal. Um, and he said to me one time, you know, because I wasn't the only person trying to get his attention, but he, he said to me one time, he said, you know why I liked you? And I said, why? He said, because you knew who Henry Cutner was. Nobody else knows who Henry <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. If, if, yeah, you know, if, if, uh, I'll give you a great example, pay it forward. Um, there's a young author named Wiley Young who yeah. approached me at, at one of the last world horror conventions. And he didn't want to talk about the rising or earthworm gods or ghoul. He wanted to talk to me about Richard Lehman. And that was fucking awesome because uh, until then I hadn't met a person his age who was still reading Lehman. Um, yeah. You know, so 
he's got my attention right away. And I don't mean to make it sound mercenary, but it comes back to that human connection that you're talking about. You know, there's there's a common bond there that you can build with people. But the, the history also is important because, uh, you know, you brought up leisure books and that whole debacle uh, earlier in the show. You know, a, a quick Cliff Notes version, uh, they were America's oldest mass market publisher. Uh, they suddenly ran into financial trouble during the uh, the collapse back in 2009, and they decided that uh, they couldn't pay their authors anymore, and they were going to file bankruptcy, and uh, they were going to keep and sell our rights as part of that process. So we went to war with them to get our rights back. But here's the thing. It wasn't the first time in the history of our business that that happened, and it's happened again since. Um yeah. And, you know, people said to me, they, they, they said, how did you know to get ahead of that? And I said, because it's happened before, you know, <laughs> the, the writing was all there on the wall. If you know your history, you can you can see these things coming. Yeah, you can look at Don Wolheim's split from Ace Books when he yep. formed Daw. Like there was those battles that, well, and he lost. He lost a lot of those. Ace still owns, like I still have a recent copy of starship troopers that he wasn't able to, to pull away from ace which is still now published by ace or, or was through the 90s at least and and you know he couldn't do anything about it even though you know it was a book that he fostered so yeah and the history is there oh and another thing that i do want to point out to people like um this is very important for people like brian has been over the years and to me personally too very kind with like helping younger writers and and technically, I'm the same generation as Brian, so I'm not yeah. a younger writer. No, really. Yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, when I say generation, I'm not referring to age. That people seem to get published in waves, right? You know, and 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 you were that wave that came along right after us. You know, that was when yeah. you broke big. Yeah. So, well, still working on breaking big, but, but I think you're a big deal. <laughs> and Des you. thinks you're a big deal. <laughs> Um, well, here's the thing, like, um, you know, in heavy metal, they call like the and musicians call it uh, being a punisher. Don't be a punisher. Here's the thing. Know your lane, people. Uh, other writers want to help you. <laughs> right. And they want to give back. But know your lane and and realize when, you know, don't punish people for trying to help you. <laughs> um, and that's really important to know that balance, because you got to be able to read the room and realize like you know, when you're in a position. And that's the thing is when you, when, when F. Paul Wilson tells you, you know why I lied to you, you knew who Henry Kuttner was, right? Um, do your homework, be, be ready for those moments. And like, a lot of times I tell people, like when you go to a writing, like when I went to Borderlands, like writing workshop and I knew F. Paul Wilson was gonna be there and Doug Winter and everything. I looked at that like my Super Bowl, right? Oh, hell yeah. I prepared for it for months ahead of time. And yes, I was only there for a weekend, but the impact that the, the Borderlands workshop had on me was a six, six month period before I left where I learned everything I could about Doug Winter. I learned everything I could about Thomas Monte Leone. I learned everything I could about F. Paul Wilson because I wanted to be prepared. And when when if you want to take this career thing seriously <laughs> preparing and taking everything seriously that you do finding ways to separate yourself right so doug winter is an insanely tough editor right? oh yes he's brutal he makes people cry um i did my homework i knew that before i went in so i was ready and then when people were like basically in tears on the side of the room when they're when he's workshopping stuff i was ready i had i had a like steel cage around my heart and i think i, I have i have doug's never edited me but he has reviewed me yeah. uh there have been times where he's been kind and there have been times where he absolutely eviscerated me and in hindsight he was right to do so <laughs> right Anyways, I'm sorry to go off on a tangent, but I oh. just want, I want, to, because I value the time that you've put in to mentoring younger writers and, and, and it shows in the impact that it, that it has down the line. As far as your work, like, 
and once you because we haven't really gotten into once you started publishing right and you had an immediate impact now i remember discovering the rising because somewhere along the way i saw an author photo that you were wearing an anthrax sweatshirt and honestly like sometimes it can be the little things i was like you know what i'm gonna read that guy because he's obviously my generation right <laughs> <laughs> and so when i first you know read brian keen it was like a little thing like that like okay the dude knows anthrax like you know you know he's he's obviously not from from that older generation so i'm gonna check and have a tweed jacket and a pipe <laughs> right but it was meaningful to me it was something that right. you know i was like okay he's my age and he's from you know he grew up reading stephen king and f paul wilson just like i did right right so like i assumed at that point that you were you know that you had read richard matheson and all those things growing up like i had and i wanted to see what somebody from my generation had created and i wasn't disappointed you revolutionary you revolutionized the genre the zombie genre but people got to remember like there wasn't zombie shit coming out right there was yeah and so it's like my buddy is in earth crisis who like everyone says they revolutionized straight edge and they're like, you know, oh, Straight Edge was huge in the 90s. Well, it's like, but when they started, there was nobody doing it, <laughs> right? Yep. And when you started, there was no, when you were doing The Rising, there was really no, there was no Walking Dead. There was no um, Dawn of the Dead remakes yet. There was nope. none of that stuff. And there was, I, I know, I, 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 if I remember correctly, you're an Alan Moore fan, correct? A little bit, yeah. Not a little bit? But yeah. He, he's got this idea. He, you know, it, it's he puts a mystical component on the zeitgeist. He calls it idea space, and he says there's this realm of energy that creatives tap into, and that sometimes we simultaneously tap into it, and that's why you get a wave of something. Um, you know, when I wrote The Rising, it was 1998, 1999, and there hadn't been anything zombie related for a long time. I think the last work was maybe Phil Nutman's wet work. And before that, the Splatterpunk anthology Books of the Dead. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm working on that novel kind of in a vacuum. What I didn't know at the same time, you know, there's this, this young filmmaker about our age named Danny Boyle, who's working on this zombie movie 28 days later and there's this guy robert Curtin working on this zombie comic the walking dead and they all came out within i think eight months of each other right and uh if you look at them all three to use your phrase revolutionized zombies but it went more than that every one of them had uh the component of a, a parent and a child uh everyone had the component of looking at what would become of the military in such a situation. Every one of them had a, a, a woman of color and a strong protagonist lead. Again, I'm not a new agey guy, but I have to wonder if Alan Moore is onto something there. Uh, and you know, now of course, zombies are everywhere. You can buy t-shirts and hot topic that rip off my shit. I don't get a dime for it, you know, but I, I understand I've put that into the culture, but yeah, when they first came out, there was nothing else you know it was it was a vacuum at that point yeah and of course when i saw the rising like in the first paperback i which was i'm, I'm pretty sure i started right there with you so yeah but i i i distinctly remember being like oh hell yeah it's cool like this is a zombie novel it's just like you know romero-esque and 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 was really excited to get something because it had been a while you know because i'm old enough right. to remember you know when romero had a trilogy you know yep. it, and um you know and it's weird because you know we all have different paths to how we come to these ideas and these things and i i like the idea of the idea space i had the similar thing with and everybody has to realize that when you have an idea that just like take paul tremblay's survivor song he didn't know he was going to be releasing that in the pandemic that right wrote a long time before that happened and and, and or um 
Mallerman's Mallory, who knew that the mask debate would be a thing when he wrote mm -hmm. a, a sequel with a kid who was desperate to take the blindfold off and that, mm -hmm. like who saw that coming, right? And so I had the same thing with, with my novel, uh, Vegan Revolution with Zombies, where everyone thought I was capitalizing off Portlandia because I that book makes fun of Portland a lot. And I'm like, no, I wrote that a long time before Portlandia existed. I just lived in Portland and I wanted to make fun of it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I didn't see that coming. It wasn't a thing. And th thank you, Portlandia, for helping the sales of Vegan Revolution with Zombies. But Because when you could say Walking Dead meets Portlandia, you know, you got something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you don't know those things. And so, yeah, when The Rising came out, it was it, it was perfectly timed and, and you had the prose angle set up. There was the comic books going on and then there was the movie. But I think you were a little ahead of those guys because I remember feeling like it was the first time I saw a zombie thing in a long time. You the know? hardcover came out 2003. The paperback came out 2004. Um, I think 28 days later, came out between the paperback and the hardcover. And then I think The Walking Dead followed uh, the release of both by about maybe four or five months, if I remember correctly. But yeah. No, so, but I wanna drill down on this. And the thing is, as somebody who values and understands the history of the genre, do you think knowing that history guided the path you took for the, the subject matter that you wrote for the way you, you kind of pushed your career forward because I've always appreciated like the direction that you took with things because I I always felt like you were thinking in terms of legacy and history at all times or was or, or am I over reading it <laughs> I mean somewhat um you know, the, the first 10 years, I wouldn't say legacy was driving me at all. Um, you know, the first 10 years, I came into this a fan. And, you know, it, the, a lot of my early creative energy was as a fan. Oh, boy, I get to do it, too, you know. Yeah, um, totally. And there's, there's something to be said for that. But, you know, early on, I remember talking with Dick Lehman and Dallas and, you know, you know Paul and Lansdale and some other folks, and every one of them impressed upon me that, you know, the way to actually do this for a living is to have a backlist, you know, have a sizable backlist that that is is always in print and earning your royalties. Um, you know, I know Jesus Gonzalez had gotten the same advice, and, and you, you look at me and him both, we were always working on the next book. We didn't take a break. It was the old pulp writer tradition. You finish one, you eat lunch, you start the next book. Um, and some of that is growing up watching my dad and his buddies at the paper mill. It's the same mindset. You know, they worked seven days a week, shift work, two weeks off a year. Um, you know, they, they'd they leave the house to go to the union meeting every week. But that's, you know, other than that, it was, it was work, work, work. Um, so the first decade of my career, it, that was pretty much the driving focus. Um, later, when I became a father again, uh, I realized what that kind of work ethic was actually costing me. It cost me a marriage. Um, it was costing me early time with my kid. And uh, I, I kind of forced myself to reprioritize. And it, it felt strange at first. Yeah, yeah it, it, it felt strange to do it first, uh, but I'm glad I did it, you know, and that is when I started thinking about legacy. It, it was when, you know, here these last 10 years, I mentioned Wiley Young earlier or somebody like Wesley Southern. You know, these are very capable authors, very talented authors. But, you know, they're coming up to me and, and saying, yeah, I read, you know, The Rising when I was a senior in high school and, and I realize to, to guys like this, uh, you know, I'm their Richard Lehman, I'm their Stephen King, I'm their Paul Wilson. Uh, so I made a conscious effort to to start setting a better example. And right about then is, is when we launched the horror show. And I thought, you know what, I, uh, I've been privileged enough and blessed enough to have 
really achieve this bullhorn, this pulpit, this voice in our industry, you know, I can use it to, to teach people and pass on what I know, be it the history of the genre, be it, you know, personalizing the people who make it, uh, be it warning them about the, the perils and the pitfalls. And, you know, even, even with the podcast over, uh, you know, I still try to do that. I, I do it on social media. I do it now in this interview, you know, and if, if you find me a, a, a signing or a con and you, you buy me a drink in the bar, I'll do it with you all night, you know? Right. Well, and that's the thing is I think with the podcast, you guys were trying to kind of balance being entertaining and um, informative. And then at the same time, so there was, there was all, there was all kinds of things that you were trying to balance with doing that. And that's one of the reasons why I think it became stressful for you guys. I, I especially know like, having the battles, especially because at a certain point, people were starting to depend on you guys to do that. And that's, yeah. that's a situation where it's like, no, slow your fucking roll. It is not Brian King's job to, to collectively save your ass <laughs> or Dan what Thomas or Mary me? San Giovanni. It's not, they're, it's not your job to, to defend the genre necessarily, right? Like you what, were doing a volunteer finally? gig. Yeah. But what, what finally broke me? And I mean, yes, it was a volunteer gig, but look, let's, let's be straight up. I was making money off that volunteer gig. It, it was a nice secondary revenue stream. Yeah, but it's true. You know, what, what finally did it for me? The last two really big incendiary news stories we reported on that, that impacted everyone in our field became a little bit more personal too. Yeah. I was, I was no longer an observer. I couldn't sit back. You know, we always prided ourselves on reporting the facts as facts, the allegations as allegations, and letting the listeners make up their own mind. And I had a lot of trouble doing that with those last two stories. One of them involved somebody I have known my entire career. Mm -hmm. And the other one ended up involving somebody who, who was, you know, quite a bit on the podcast. Um, and I, I could not in, in any way condone either of their behavior, uh, but I share as much blame as anyone else for bringing them into the field in the first place. Yeah. And, uh, Tough. it fucking broke me, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to get emotional now. It, it shattered me in ways the only other thing that's ever broke me that hard was when jesus gonzalez passed away um and i i i told mary and dave and matt i said i i cannot do this anymore i'm i'm gonna have a stroke I, or i'm gonna press the nuke button and bring this whole fucking industry down, one or the other uh so you know we you went out on top it's the only way to be safe <laughs> right yeah, i mean you know we uh, we you know, we can laugh and say, well, we went out on top and we did go out on top. But uh, I, I realized that to do that kind of work, that that bullhorn and that pulpit that I had actually gets in the way of doing that kind of work. When you know everybody in the business, it becomes impossible to report on everything in the business uh, objectively. What's yeah. nice is that you know, it's, it's been over almost exactly a year now. And I do see multiple other people stepping up and trying to do the same thing. Uh, and that's very encouraging. I, I like that. Yeah. Well, and listen, as somebody who, you know, I had an interesting reaction when you announced that you were, you were done doing it because as somebody who listened every week, who looked forward to it every week um, and, you know, enjoyed hearing your voice every week right and mary and dave and and matt and just you know i you know it's like kind of like hanging with friends it was very different from some podcasts because it really just did just feel like hanging out right but the very first i i, I had the reaction i remember i was on a walk when i was listening to it and i had the reaction like i kind of took a few steps and i was like god that sucks and then I thought to myself, you know what? I'd rather have Brian writing. I'd rather have Brian writing. I'd rather have like a stack of books someday that I know came out of that period. I 
and I would rather have, I'd rather know that Brian is spending time with Dungeon Master. I'd rather know that those things are happening than, than, than get what I got out of the podcast, right? I'd rather have right. you doing those things, right? And, and then, and for me, like, for example, like I, the only reason I do this podcast at all is mostly if people listen to it, to me, it's a benefit, <laughs> right? But right. mostly it's, I finished reading a book and I want to talk to the author and I want to find out how they did it, right? And if anyone lis listens to my interviews regularly, they're usually a process of me, especially once I get into spoilers and I start drilling down, like I get real nitty gritty about the writing of these things. And so for me, it's like, I'll do this. And hopefully one, some day down the line, someone's going to say, you know, when you talk to Josh Mallerman about that train scene in Mallory, it's what opened my eyes to how I can write horror. Right. Um, or, or maybe they say, you know, like, you know, I listened to your conversation with Brian Keene and I realized I need to know the history. You know, I need to know who Henry Kuttner is. And you do. Yeah, you do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, if somebody down the line tells me that, if one person tells me that, that's great, you know? And, you know, it's, it's, I like it when, you know, you reached out to me and just said, and sent me a message just saying, hey, David, you're, I'm really enjoying the podcast. And that fucking meant the world to me, you know? Well, thanks. Um, because one person, it, it wasn't so much that it was Brian Keene saying it. It was that a guy named Brian told me, I'm really enjoying right. your podcast. It doesn't matter who. Yep. I, di I dig I dig what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to put it out there that I'm glad you quit. <laughs> Even though I love I am too. You yeah. know, my... My 13-year-old dungeon master, he, uh, for, for people who are, who, who are new to my work, that's not his real name. Uh, you know, he, uh, you know, would be growing, awesome if you named your kid dungeon. Yeah. Master. I mean, you know, he's, he's growing up in a world where, you know, his dad is a personality notoriety and, you know, he wants to be a normal kid and I don't want his name out there in public until he's old enough to make that decision for himself. But he and I, uh, we were we were talking the other day and uh you know he brought up the podcast and he said he asked me he says you know do you miss doing it and i said i miss laughing with everybody and having fun i said but i i don't miss doing the podcast and i said to him i said do you do you miss me doing the podcast and he said no you seem a lot happier these days <laughs> right i bet <laughs> yeah so so let's talk about let's now let's do some nitty gritty stuff. Let's talk okay. about your writing habits now that the podcast is over. Because, you know, you talked about those early days when you were just pumping things out. And maybe the most legendary, like, pumping it out thing ever we've covered on Dickheads to great extreme, which was the um, early to mid 60s with Philip K. Dick when he was doing, when he, like, literally had a shed a mile from his home and was doing drugs to be writing as much as he possibly could. Yeah. Which by the way, turned out his masterpiece three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge came out of that drug fueled insanity in the hovel. Um, and so you had your days where you were trying to do that, but now you're trying to do it with, with a balance. And originally I had talked to you about just wanting to have you on to talk about writing habits and because personally, like right now, my writing habits, I have to fit them around a full-time job, right? Right. And I make the joke, I made the joke because I've been on vacation for three weeks. And like at the beginning of vacation, I said, all right, my vacation from work or from my job starts, now the work begins, <laughs> right? <laughs> because that's the way I, I'm like, vacation time means I got to fucking get a lot of work done, <laughs> right? right? Work. So I'm interested in your writing habits now as like somebody who, you know, is balancing being a father and has some maturity in the field, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm lucky enough that this is my full-time job, you know, where you're, those of, uh, those of you watching it on YouTube, this is, this is my office. This is where I work. Um, you know, I usually get up five o'clock every morning, like clockwork. Um, I work out, eat my breakfast, read the news, 
scan Twitter, see what's going on, uh, quickly promote whatever I'm promoting that day because, you know, this is a business and you, you got to market and promote. Um, but usually around 6.30 or so, I'll start working. Um, if it's a school year, uh, I knock off around 7.45, take my kid to school, come back and get back to it. If it's summer, I just work straight through. Um, but, you know, I'll usually go to around one or two in the afternoon every day. That seems to be my most creative time. Um, Me too. I have to, you know, I have to, I have to do things I didn't used to have to do. Like I have to get up every hour and make myself move around or I stiffen up like a mummy. Um, but you know, usually around two I'll knock off, uh, you know, spend some time with the kiddo, spend the evening with him, spend time with, with Mary. Uh, if, you know, he's 13, if he'd rather be playing Minecraft with his buddies or, you know, chatting on discord and, you know, I might come back to work in the evening. Mary works best at night. Um, you know, her best hours are from like eight o'clock at night till about four in the morning. So that's when she writes. So, you know, I'll spend a couple hours with her together. And then when she starts working, you know, if, if I still have it in me, I'll, I'll come back and do another hour or two of work. Um, but the, the prime is, are those morning hours. And I try to, I try to do that seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, now, like you said, I, I'm older, I'm balancing family and everything else. Come the weekend, I'm not beholden to that schedule. You know, if the kid wants to do something or I decide I want to go fishing or fuck off and play Xbox for the day, I'll do it. Uh, but but Monday through Friday, I try to stick to that. Yeah. And I think having routines and things that you do um, are so important. So what I did was I... Um, I work in Ocean Beach, which is, um, I work with kids with disabilities. So like I'm, I'm a teacher's aide in a classroom for kids with autism. And the school that I work at is in the hippie surf town part of San Diego. And I was spending an hour a day because I lived in another part of the city, an hour each way coming here on the bus, which was fine because I liked reading. So I was getting all my reading done because I could read a hundred pages in a, a bus commute. And right. before that was fine, but then I had the realization that the most important time for me writing was the morning. So my wife and I had a discussion and I was like, well, if I lived in the same neighborhood as the school, I could get up at five in the morning and I'd have three hours to write and I would only have to like put on my shoes and go out the door with 10 minutes. You have to find right. ways that adapt to your schedule to make sure, you know, and for me, moving closer to work is more expensive because I live near the ocean now. But right. to me, that cost of like two or three hundred dollars more a month in rent was worth it because I'm being more productive. I'm getting more work done. And you've hit on it. You you have to find what works for you. You know, Bev Vincent uh, has had a very successful career. Bev still has a day job. Um, you know, and he he just gets up an hour early every morning. And, and for that hour, that's when he does his writing. Uh, you know, when I still had day job and I had all kinds of day jobs, I worked in a foundry. I was a truck driver. I was a disc jockey. I worked in a daycare center. Um, you know, but I would, I would try to find an hour or two every day to write. And, and I, I, it sounds stupid, but you talk to so many people who will tell you about the novel they want to write, you know, and, and the characters and the plot, and you know, maybe they've drawn this elaborate fantasy map. And when you say, well, how much have you written? Oh, I haven't, you know, yeah. writing, writing involves just that writing. It involves your ass in the chair and your fingers on the keyboard. Yeah. You know? Well, that's the Oliver Stone saying the most important equation in writing is ass plus chair equals writing. Yeah. And, and, and you know, sometimes that limitation of saying like, I've only got those hours I, a lot of my most productive writing writing is because I know like, all right, I have from when I get the dogs out and everything ready, I have from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. where I'm just locked in. You know, I just recently wrote a full draft of a screenplay in 17 days while working full time. That's and, impressive. Yeah. Well, part of it was because like 
you know, I was just like, all right, I, I can't play basketball this week with my homies. But I like, and I'm just making decisions like, you know, no watching movies this time, you know, I'm just going to go sit down and do it in discipline. But a lot of it happened in the, that two hour window every morning because right. I just got fucking locked in and I said, here's my time. And I just got, I got a haul ass. Can't look at the internet <laughs> during this time. Obviously a lot of people were wondering why I was so quiet. <laughs> it's Cause I wrote a script <laughs> in 17 fucking days. And um, you know, you, you just, a lot of it's discipline, but all right. So what are, what's some of the work that you've been, you've finished since the podcast was over? Like what, what, what do we have to read now? As um, we- well, let's see. With Teeth just came out. Uh, I, stuff I finished in the last year, uh, With Teeth is out in paperback and ebook and audiobook. It's a, it's a vampire novella. Uh, if, you, if you write horror sooner or later, you are expected to write about vampires and write about werewolves. If you yeah, don't, what took they, you they, so they fucking long? <laughs> yeah, so uh, that that is out. Um, I got that shit out of the way. Yeah, I, no, a, a lot of the stuff that I'm working on, I I can't really talk about yet. Uh, you know, readers know that I'm working on something that involves uh, a Stephen certain King's someone. Castle Rock. Yeah, Stephen King's Castle Rock and certain characters created by Stephen King and or Richard Chismar. But I can't say what that is or or when it's coming out or anything more about it. Um, uh, so uh, I'm here. I'm feeling the word trilogy here, but uh, possibly. Uh, well, it's it's not what you expect. Let's put it that way. It, okay. I think it's going to blow everyone's minds. Uh, Chris Golden and I, we talked about Lansdale's The Drive-In earlier. Uh, this I can talk about. Chris Golden and I uh, are putting the finishing touches on a tribute anthology to The Drive-In. It's, it's all new stories. Uh, I would list all of the contributors, but but I will forget people, but uh, it's it's well-rounded. We have new voices like Gabino Iglesias, Cynthia Paleo, S.A. Cosby. Uh, we have veterans like, like David Scow and Elizabeth Massey and Norman Partridge. Um, but yeah, basically all new stories set in the Drive-In trilogy, including a new story from Joe himself. Uh, that'll probably be out Christmas, probably more likely early next year. Um, and I'm putting the finishing touches on a, a novel right now called Invisible Monsters, which was supposed to be about the invisible monster in Lovecraft lore that that devoured the author of the Necronomicon in, uh, in broad daylight. And instead, it has become about the secret billionaires that really control the world. <laughs> Oh, that sounds like monster. a topic Brian Keane's been dying to write about for a long time. <laughs> it is, you know, and it, and I, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. It's not a you know a far right uh, QAnon perspective, nor is it a you know a, a far left uh, uh, Illuminati perspective. It, 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 it's a, it's about you know cap unchecked capitalism is the real monster. <laughs> Right. Well, and it's funny because when you wrote your Lost Level books, you got a chance to really show the pulp influence and, and and that kind of stuff, which, you know, that's when you show that you're a guy who knows who Henry Cutner is. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, or uh, especially his wife, C.L. Moore, wrote great mm-hmm. uh, sort of sorcery stuff. By the way, she's Absolutely. a Hoosier. She's from my home state of Indiana and, in fact, went to college in my hometown, C.L. Moore. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that that history, um, I guess um, you know I'm really looking forward to 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 seeing where you go with things because you have a lot of time to really now um, uh, to develop a, a a zero fucks given voice. You know, a lot of people don't understand when Stephen King said he was retiring, they were like, "Oh yeah, he keeps putting out books," and he was like. No, the machine Stephen King was retiring. And that's exactly it. Uh, I I learned my lesson from when Stephen King did that, and I'm going to phrase it differently. But I'm I'm about at the same point. Uh, I uh, I've got a new novel coming out in August called The Seventh. It is the the first book in a six book series that you know unabashedly is my version of The Dark Tower. Uh, you know, all of my stuff from the rising to now, it all takes place in a shared universe. 
And, you know, the marketing, which I wrote myself, you know, keeps saying the end is here. And I know my fans are taking that to mean I'm going to stop writing. It's not what I'm saying. But the machine is coming to an end after after these six books are published. Um, and right. you, you nailed it. Uh, I can't show it to you, but there's a post-it note right up here that says uh, fucks in a circle and it's crossed out. Um, I am at that point where I, I want to write about what I want to write about. I want to talk about what I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to give everybody the satisfying conclusion that they they deserve and that's warranted. Uh, but when it's done, the machine is done. Yeah. You know, and, and that's that's how I want to spend my my old age. Yeah, well, Anthony and I have been in this process. We wrote a, a novel together, Anthony Trevino and I, uh, Nightmare City. And we could have published it with any number of independent publishers and all these things. And I had to like give myself a note of saying, uh, never settle, because I believe real seriously in this book and like um, that it's a next level thing that I that I can do. And I always have to remind myself a lot of really big books got rejected 50, 60, 100 times until the right person found it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so I had to kind of give myself a, zero, a, a reminder. I was like, you know, never settle, you know, mm -hmm. because I would rather just wait with that book and have it find the right home than, than settle, right? Because I, I believe in it more than anything else I've ever written actually, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Right. And um, in taking a zero fucks attitude a lot of times is like, can be like, it can be like, I don't, I don't care what you want from me. I'm going to, I, I'm going to, and I think for, for you and for Stephen King, for people who have like long established careers, it's different. You know, you guys get to the point where it's like, I'm going to write what I feel, you know, works for me and not the machine, right? Well, that's exactly it. And, you know, you brought up the lost level. I, uh, for, for 15 years, I was afraid to, to write that first novel. I, I had it, the whole thing in my head, but, you know, it, it's, uh, it's completely different than anything else I've done. And I, I, I didn't think the public would go for it. And it shows you how much I know because it's one of my most successful series. But, uh, you know, there's stuff I want to do that's just for me. Like your pub, one of your publishers, Clash Books, Christoph and Lisa. I would dearly love to work with them on something because I just, I adore them both. The stuff I'm writing isn't right for Clash Books. I would never submit it to them. I want to, I want to be able to sit down and the machine is done and I can say, okay, I'm going to take the next couple months and I'm going to write something specifically that I think Lisa and Christoph will enjoy. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't have the luxury of doing that yet, right. but I can see it on the horizon. I, I can see that point coming, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, it's, 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 it's a, a, a wonderful feeling of freedom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, right here, uh, my Cody Goodfellow shelf reminded me, Cody and I have talked a long time about the difference between persona and you know, like authors sometimes develop a persona and you had this specific situation because you were doing the podcast and, um, but you also kind of had like the, the kind of, you know, I'm Brian fucking Keen kind of persona, but, you know, well, what I think it was so great about for me even getting to meet you was to, um, to see like the the fanboy and the the steward and the hist the the fan of the history of the genre like a, as a person and one to one, and that's that's really one of the main things I wanted to do today was to have a conversation with that guy, <laughs> right? You know? Is that what you got? I think so. So we're we're nearing the <laughs> end here, and um, and like because see, for me that. With, with postcards, usually I, my mission is to like nuts and bolts of a book. And this is normally the mission that I do with dickheads. And yeah, I'm kind of transitioning to be more of a science, science fiction guy. That's my path in the future. I've kind of made my decision that, you know, I've, I have one transitional book 
that's like part punk horror, part sci-fi that I, I want to bridge. Right. Um, and uh, I've written it. I just haven't found the right home for it. But, and I want to bridge that. And I want to start moving towards being a science fiction guy. And part of it was that for me, when I was a kid, I was intimidated by science fiction because I thought horror felt more punk rock to me and science fiction felt more like the big league, like that yeah. you have to have more skills to do science fiction. I realize now that's, that's horseshit. Every, you know, it's all the same. But with dickheads, I've tried so hard to, to make it my mission to learn the history of the genre. And we're lucky because in sci-fi, we have books like The Futurians, which is like the biogra- Damon Knight's biography of the, right. of the Asimovs. And, the, and you have the Eureka years about Boucher and, and, and the foundation of fantasy and mag- magazine of fantasy and science fiction. You're, you are kind of sort of behind the scenes working on a history of horror, right? Like I am. Um, and I keep saying, I am not the guy to do it. I'm, you know, I'm not an academic. Um, the, the two greatest minds that we had that, that, well, the three greatest minds that we had that could have pulled it off, Carl Edward Wagner, JF Gonzalez, and John Peelan. And unfortunately, all three of them no longer with us. Um, you know, Doug, Doug Winter has a vast knowledge. Uh, you know, there, there's other folks that have a vast knowledge. David Scowl, I don't, I don't think uh, people credit him enough for his his knowledge of the history yep. of the genre. That's why um, I had him on the Matheson show. Like, I yeah. basically said I wouldn't do it if I couldn't get Scow. Yeah, I mean, you know, David has has forgotten more than you and I will, will ever learn or be aware of. Um but yeah, I, End of the Road did so well for Cemetery Dance that, you know, Rich was like, what do you want to do next? And I said, well, you know, I want to do, a, I don't want to do an academic history of horror fiction because I'm not that guy, but I just, I want to, I, I want to write a history yourself of short there, Brian. I think you could be that guy, but. I mean, I had a semester and a half at community college, you know, if that makes <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I wanted to write about it from a fan's perspective, but the, the entire history of horror fiction and uh yeah i I sort of fell away from that last year during the pandemic i I think i got one column written last year um it's funny mary and i were just talking about this yesterday i've got a a bunch of columns written that we we need to start it up again but real talk um a lot of the people i want to focus on were alive when I started this column and aren't now. And uh, it's starting to occur to me that it's such a big undertaking that I might not get to finish it either. And that's a little scary. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make an attempt. And uh, if I don't get it finished, um, Stephen Kozanowski, who we mentioned earlier, he's in charge of my literary estate. So uh, he's going to find out now listening to this show. He, he is going to be in charge of finishing it. So. <laughs> yeah he has been drafted, has been drafted. Um, well I think you're selling yourself a little short because you know the history now writing an academic book is a totally different thing but I think I would say I would say forget that notion if you look at the Futurians for example Damon Knight's yeah. class it's a great book it's a great book but he doesn't worry about making it an academic he makes it like I want to make you feel like you were there right. in the 30s and 40s with them and I think taking that attitude might be, might uh, free you up a little bit. But it, but you know what's interesting too is that the difference between science fiction and um, she's one of my absolute favorite podcast guests I've ever had, and one of the people that it, it makes the difference between science fiction and horror in this sense is that uh, one of my favorite guests on the Dickheads we've had her on three or four times and having her on again to talk about Judith Merrill is Lisa Yazik, who is actually a professor of science fiction at Georgia Tech, right? We, there are actual professors of science well, fiction, yeah, many of them, all over the place. We don't have professors of horror fiction uh, right now. And, and that is unfortunate. Um, I think, you know, so out there, if you're a young horror fan that wants to learn the history, that could be your niche. 
you know, find one of these programs, find a program like the one at Georgia Tech. I'm sure Lisa, for example, if she had an undergrad who said like, I wanna be the horror expert, I wanna pioneer this field, there, you, there, there's a home for you. There's a PhD with your name on it that Absolutely. you could be that person. So yeah. somebody out there listening, finish this work for Brian and you, you realize who I your mean, first interview is gonna be. And you know, that's honestly, that's who, I don't wanna say I'm jealous of, but the people I am in all of in this industry and, and you know, understand I'm coming from a place where I've, I've been on the bestseller list and I've done this and I've done that. And I'm not bragging, I'm putting things in context. Right. The people I'm in awe of are the people like Doug Winter, like St. Yoshi, uh, who can talk about this with the magnitude and the gravitas that it deserves. Um, you know, with, with that 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 PhD in mind, I can't do that. I lack the vocabulary and and the, the critical thinking to do that. I acknowledge it. I can come at it as a fan and say, "Here's why this is cool." Um, but yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm in awe of people who can do that. And absolutely, our field needs more of that. So I, I echo your call. So, so let's put this out to the universe. Brian Kane, David Agronoff, right now, we're saying somebody out there who's younger, that's your angle. That's your path. Um, be that person. Um, because I guarantee you, if you go to a PhD program at any one of these professors that study science fiction and there's... Uh, there's really good programs in England. Um, there's uh, like Dr. Una McCormick, who is known for writing Star Trek novels, but she's actually, she just retired from teaching science fiction for many years in England, right? And um, it's hilarious that like, you know, she left to write Star Trek novels full time, right? But it, it, it's a, it's a, there are people who make their career. Like I am so jealous every time I see an email from Lisa that, that has her title, right. you know, professor of science fiction studies. I'm like, dude, she was way smarter than me. If I had done that and back in the day, I'd be <laughs> such a fucking happy person studying all of it. And somebody out there is, is going to fill that role for you. And I keep writing the columns, keep doing your thing because your version of it, Brian, is going to be footnoted in this person's work in the future, you know, and because we need that firsthand knowledge. So, um, and, and so if I sound like I'm really pumping you on that project, it's because that's the one of yours that this guy who loves the history of the genre is, is just dying for, you know, I'm on it, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So I've taken a lot of your time, Brian, and I, 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 um, I, I just, Let's let's go through what with the news. So, with teeth is the most recent release. With right? teeth is uh, the new release, um, and the the seven will be out in hardcover next month, August. Um, wow, and, that's uh, got to be quite a feeling to get that that done, right? It's a good feeling. Uh, hardcover August uh, paperback. So is that is, is your magnum opus? Is it done? Done? Are you already? Or you still got some to go on it? The first two books are done. Um, the third book is plotted, but I haven't written it yet. Uh, and books four through six, because again, learning from Stephen King, you know, he was in the middle of the Dark Tower when he had his accident. Um, books four through six are extensively plotted out, something I never do with my work. But, uh, you know, I'm much more of a seat of a pants writer, but. Yeah, I know. I've, I like, mention that. Yeah, I've, I've done plotter. copious notes just in case something happens to me. Here you go, Kazanowski. Here's how you finish it. <laughs> Well, that, you know, and that's, that's kind of important because we, you know, King got hit by a van and a certain somebody set themselves on fire. So oh. let's be, let's be careful. And, you know, I want you to finish that for sure. I don't want I'd to. I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, um, all right. So Brian, I just, I really appreciate your time. I think, um, uh, the world of, of everything that you've done for keeping and, and validating the history. Um, well, I do think that um, in the same way that, you know, F. Paul Wilson said, you know, I like you because you know Henry Kuttner. <laughs> um, we want people to not forget, like, people like F. Paul Wilson, who are so foundational and so important to, and I know right now he's still a bestseller. So it's like kind of, 
you know, I, I just, but also like people know Paul from his books, but like the, the amount, you know, he's my plotting Yoda. Like I look up to him for, for plotting and nobody plots like that guy. And Agreed. I think the, um, looking at the impact that some of these writers have on a, on a deeper level, like going forward and some of the, the, and especially too some of the lost voices from the paperbacks from, from hell era too, you know, like, you know, we we're losing people all the time from that Absolutely. era. And, um, you know, what Valancourt's doing with reissuing a lot of those books, like learn your history folks, like, read about the genre you guys have no idea what it was like reading horror in the late 80s early 90s when like you could go to a drugstore and get it and they were on spinner racks and it was fucking awesome like yep. you know that was that was great shit <laughs> you know we lived paperbacks from hell yeah. <laughs> yeah i know exactly and you know and it's hilarious too because there are sometimes with paperbacks uh from from hell when you when when you look at that book and you're like sometimes you're flooding through that and you find books that you didn't remember reading. And then you're like, Oh shit. I remember that weird cat horror. No. Well, and I was so undiscriminating. I, I, you know, I read everything. So I read a lot of shit back then too. Like, uh, you know, William W. Johnstone, that the devil's cat, the, the yeah. infamous one. But I read that and I knew it was terrible, but I was 14. So I still loved it. You know, <laughs> well, right and then every once in a while you get like um uh, john shirley sellers which has a hilarious yeah. cover with you know with like you know i can't remember what the tagline was the tagline was hilarious but that's well, a fucking incredible novel and john's a fucking you know i mean he's my favorite writer so like and you know i've worked with john and 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 i it, you know he that book is like kind of like a cheesy paperback but god it was a fucking masterpiece you know big big influence on me as well man uh yeah. definitely yeah that yeah is. and so you never know so like you know and and um you know john's in that zero fucks to give thing too like he just recently did a, a total jack van style fantasy novel yeah and it's like that's something that he would have never done years ago right you know but. he's one of the few that I still get a little starstruck around. There, there are very few, uh, but yeah, I, I've run into them exactly twice. Uh, once was the first world horror I ever went to, and once was the year I got the Grandmaster Award. And both times, I, I wanted to say all the things, and both times I immediately started babbling like an idiot, and I just shut myself up. Another one is uh, Steve Bissett, the comic artist. Um, you know, Mary and I were at a, a con several years ago, and she was on a panel with him. And of course, Mary doesn't read comic books, so she has no frame of reference for who Steve is. And she invites him to lunch with us. And I sat there like, this, this is the guy with Alan Moore that did Swamp Thing. What the fuck am I going to say? <laughs> I think for I mean, me, John Shirley has that, he has that effect on me. Um, Richard Matheson had that effect on me. I couldn't, yeah, I, it took me a long time to, I, met him three times the third time was the only time i managed to like speak to him and he ended up telling me a really great anecdote about um writing i am legend for a ucla novel writing class yeah. and i because i told him the dog chapter is like the most a, a book ever made me like weep you know and he said that um he was in a class at ucla and the teacher made him read that chapter to the class. Yeah. And that when he got done reading it, the teacher said, that's a writer, folks. Wow. And like, you know, this was at uh, the Bram Stoker Awards in like 2004 or five, I think. Yeah. And he was just doing a signing and, and he just told that story. And, and I was like across the table and I'm just like, whoa, <laughs> you know, but I, it, well, and John too, like, uh, now that John and I have like worked together on a screenplay and a few other things, like I, I I've kind of chilled out on a lot of that, but right. um, he wrote the introduction to my short story collection, amazing punk stories. And I literally just pet the first page of his introduction to it for like <laughs> five minutes afterwards. Cause I was just like, it's real. It's real. <laughs> uh, because wet bones to me, um, is my 
ultimate horror novel. Like I yeah. like Wet Bones. Like there is no horror novel that I like more than Wet Bones, and and so you know John is a literal rock star to me. But you know, and so but those those are those moments. And you had them with Dallas, and you had them with you know where you just you can't believe or Richard Lehman, where you can't believe. Yeah. You know, and then that's when you get to learn like that there are people too, you know, yeah. and then, uh, yeah. But anyways, Brian, I, I could go on all day. You are fucking Absolutely, awesome, brother. man. You are fucking awesome. I, I appreciate all the <laughs> shit that you do. All those fucking things on the shelf behind you. All those awards are so fucking well earned. Uh, another one of those pinch myself moments of my life was um, at World Horror in Portland when I was reading my gross out story and you and John Skip keeled over for part of it. I'll it never is, forget that. <laughs> is to this day, one of the greatest achievements of my writing career was making, was having a moment that got both Skip and Keen sitting next to each other to keel over. Is something that I will always be proud of um you know that is that is that is something and i just appreciate the shit out of what you do say hi to mary and dave and everybody me, brother me. and um i'm sure uh once i get around to reading with teeth i'll have you back on to break that fucker down awesome man let's do it all right all right thanks for having thanks for coming on bud appreciate